side, you have buildings that are built on a foundation of shifting sand dunes. This isn't granite, it's going to re erode. We need to get our best minds together, the public and policymakers, with land use planners and zoning people who bring their expertise, hydrogeologists, wetland scientists, uh, environmental engineers to rethink the built environment along the Great Lakes shoreline and how to better use natural systems to absorb some of the higher water levels when that's happening. And as we've articulated in the climate change report that came out last year, the Environmental Law and Policy Center commissioned a team of 18 leading scientists uh, from the Midwest Big Ten universities and the Canadian universities to do a state of the science report assessing the impact of climate change on the Great Lakes. Um, this is real and we need to do what we can to mitigate and that's the recommended policy solutions so that we can alleviate some of the climate change impacts. We also need to adapt and recognize the climate change realities including much higher water levels and sometimes lower water levels. So here's what we're doing this morning. We're turning to Drew Grunwald of the University of Michigan, one of the leading experts on the Great Lakes hydrology. Um, Drew is gonna take us through the facts and the data and what's happening for about 10 minutes or so. We're gonna open it up for Q&A. Uh, please um, use the chat box if you wanna submit a question, put it in there. We'll do our very best to have a conversation uh, between people who have questions and Drew. And I look forward to uh, wrapping up after that. Thank you for joining us. And let me uh, pass the microphone over to Drew Grunwald of the University of Michigan uh, and NOAA. Howard, thanks very much. Uh, what I'm going to do now is um, share my screen um, so I can start the presentation. And I'm probably going to put my video on mute for now, um, but keep my audio going. So welcome, everybody. And thank you, uh, Howard and ELPC, for the opportunity. Hopefully at this point you can see the slides that I'm planning on sharing um, with the title across the top there, Rising Water Levels Across the Great Lakes. As Howard mentioned, I'm an associate professor at the University of Michigan with the School for Environment and Sustainability. And I also have adjunct appointments in civil and environmental engineering, as well as in earth and environmental sciences. So over the, over the next two minutes, there are three things I wanna hit on. The first is, a brief contextual introduction uh, that I think is important to the narrative of the science behind water levels, uh, basically regarding the magnitude of the Great Lakes and how complex they are. I then wanna give you a snapshot of historical water levels to continue providing the context for where we are. And then finally, a brief discussion about water level projections, not only what's being projected for the upcoming season, but also a little bit of the science that goes into making those projections. And before I go any further, I do need to thank a um, wonderful set of teammates that I've had over the years. These are my colleagues when I worked at the NOAA Great Lakes Environmental Research Laboratory. And then this slide are my current team at the University of Michigan, postdoctorate fellows, graduate students, and even undergraduates. The, the work that I'm showing you here would absolutely not be possible without this wonderful team of colleagues and collaborators. So I want to start off with this satellite image of the Great Lakes that is not only I think visually compelling, but I show it because it underscores the range of hydrological and climatological processes that we are trying to understand, capture in our models and our data sets, and translate into forecasts as part of this whole story of water level forecasting. So just to be clear, we're, we're looking here at the Great Lakes and you can see um, all of the clouds and underlying those, the water vapor that's being transferred off of the lakes at this time of year. This is a winter shot showing lake evaporation. But of course, at the same time, we have a lot of snow across the region uh, that's melting into the Great Lakes in the spring. Um, we have changes in precipitation dynamics. All of those go into the water level story and they all need to be captured accurately to make forecasts. So here's a look at water levels, and we are very fortunate in the Great Lakes region to have data that goes all the way back to the mid-1800s. So this is a long-term look at water levels. On the bottom axis here, you'll see the years starting at 1860 going all the way to present. And then we have the lakes divided up into four systems here, Lake Superior, Lake Michigan, and Huron. From a large hydrological perspective, we typically view them as one large lake, Lake Erie and Lake Ontario. 
the water elevations for each of these are on the left. And for each data set, um, there's sort of three points or three character types. Light blue dots are monthly water levels. Dark blue dots are annual water levels. And then the red line is the average water level over the period of record. So a few really important points in the historical record to note here. One, without going back too, too far, in the mid-1960s, some important events. Across much of the Great Lakes, particularly Lake Michigan and Lake Huron, we hit record lows during that time period. Uh, and that provides context for a lot of people in terms of where they built infrastructure um, and their perspective on the lakes. But it's also the time, if you look downstream, and I know this isn't as relevant to this part of the Midwest, but on Lake Ontario, this is where they imposed uh, restraints and a control plan on the outflow of Lake Ontario, and you can see it had a significant impact on the water level oscillations on Lake Ontario. Water levels peaked in the mid-1980s, reaching record highs, and then there was a precipitous decline in the late 1990s. Getting more to the present, it's, it's fascinating to look at this historical record and to recognize that for the past 20 years, Water level dynamics on the Great Lakes have been characterized by two unprecedented features, particularly on Lake Michigan, Lake Huron. One is a period of persistent, below average water level conditions. And you can see that here on Lake Michigan and Lake Huron. Never before has there been such a persistent and consistent below average condition on the lakes. And then starting in 2014, right after a record low on Lake Michigan, Lake Huron was set in January of 2013, water levels surged. Never before over a period, particularly in 2014, 2015, and 2016, have water levels on Lake Michigan and Lake Huron or on Lake Superior risen so quickly. Now we're at the point where every month over the past several months, Lake Michigan and Lake Huron have been breaking their monthly records. Lake Ontario broke its record high levels in 2017 and 2019, and we're going to continue breaking records throughout the season. So from a climatological perspective, it's important to recognize that all of this water level fluctuation represents what, I th what I've come to describe as sort of a push and a pull or a tug of war on water levels. The hydrologic cycle and the water balance of the Great Lakes is not particularly complicated. Precipitation comes into the system through either precipitation falling on the lake surfaces or precipitation that falls on the land surfaces that makes its way through rivers and streams. And then water is lost from each of the lakes through evaporation. So we essentially can boil down the water, the water balance in each of the lakes to precipitation falling on the lakes, river flow coming into each of the lakes, and water loss through evaporation. Of course, a big part of the hydrologic cycle is the extent to which that water leaves each one of the lakes through the channels that connect them. But to keep things simple, precipitation, evaporation, and runoff. What we're looking at on this slide right here is the long-term record of precipitation on each of the lake systems. This is a very similar graph to what I showed earlier. We're looking at a time span on the bottom from 1860 to roughly present. The water surface elevation scale is on the left-hand side, but I've added a new scale on the right-hand side, which is the total annual precipitation. So the blue line with several dots in it, that represents the water level on each of the lakes. But I want you to pay attention to the vertical bars. Those orange and green bars represent the annual total precipitation across each of these lakes. And importantly, the orange bars represent years where precipitation has been below average, and the green bars represent years where precipitation is above average. And throughout most of the system, you'll see a pattern here that is similar to what is in climate change projections, and all types of empirical evidence across the Great Lakes, which is that precipitation has been going up and it's going up consistently. One of the recent studies or analyses that my postdoc and I just did indicates that what used to be the 90th percentile of precipitation is now the average. That's an extraordinary transition in what we might consider the normal of precipitation. But another point I wanna make when we're looking at this is that it's not precipitation alone, that explains water level variability. You can see for much of this record that as precipitation goes up and down, particularly in the mid 1960s and 70s, as precipitation changed, water level changed, but the abundant precipitation 
in the late 1990s does not explain this water level decline, particularly on Michigan, Huron, and Erie. And so if I shift my slide to instead show precipitation in the background, I'm now going to show you evaporation in the background. And here's where we provide a great explanation for why water levels declined so rapidly in the late 1990s. The short answer is that evaporation rates went through the roof. So these two slides in concert, even though they're showing a particular story about the decline in the late 1990s and the long-term record, I think they underscore the challenge that we face in the Great Lakes, which is that water level fluctuations are responding to this tug of war between these two competing forces that are not only increasing in magnitude, but we're finding that they're also increasing in variability. Precipitation is going up and becoming more variable. Evaporation is going up and becoming more variable as well. So if we look ahead in terms of trying to make forecasts, whether it's over seasonal timescales or multi-year timescales, I think it's imperative to consider what is driving these changes in temperature and precipitation across the region that ultimately propagate into water level dynamics. And really almost all of the story comes from understanding these air masses that dominate North American climate and short-term meteorology. So there are essentially these groups of air masses. If we start at the top, there's the continental Arctic air mass, which is very, very cold and very, very dry, followed by the continental polar dry and cold air masses. Now, these are critical to the hydrologic cycle. In 2014, when we had an Arctic air outbreak or the Arctic polar vortex deformation, and a huge chunk of Arctic cold air descended right on the Great Lakes, evaporation rates slowed down tremendously. And that's part of the trigger for why water levels increased so rapidly. But we live in a part of the country where we're not just influenced by these continental Arctic and polar air masses, we're influenced by maritime polar air masses, which bring a lot of moisture and in general, colder air temperatures, but also maritime tropical air masses, particularly air masses that come up from the Gulf of Mexico and can bring tremendous amounts of moisture into the region. There is not a great forecasting system right now on a global or continental scale for projecting what's gonna happen with these air masses two, three, or four months ahead of time from right now. Yet it is these air masses that are absolutely going to be dictating what happens with regards to temperature and precipitation looking into the future. So if we use that as context, I can show you one of what I think is the better forecasting systems, at least for this context. The Army Corps of Engineers is, is charged with developing seasonal water level projections. Some of those projections try to look at future precipitation and temperature patterns, but I think a more telling approach to the problem is looking at plausible scenarios um, and taking a look at what's happened historically and understanding the likelihood of historical um, water level sequences into the future. So what this projection is showing, I just downloaded it this morning. This is looking at Lake Michigan and Lake Huron. Um, on the bottom axis, you can see we're going from January 28 right up until present. The Black dots in the middle of the page here represent the long-term average water levels. You can see the strong seasonal cycle here of Lake Michigan and Lake Huron. The dashed lines at the bottom are record low water levels. And then the black solid line here is the actual water level right now. These dashes at the top are record highs for each of the months. So as you can see, over the past several months here, January, February, and March, uh, Water levels have essentially, water level records have essentially been shattered on Lake Michigan and Lake Huron. What you see going off to the right are a bunch of scenarios into the future about what would happen to water levels if we reproduced hydrologic conditions or water supplies from previous years. In this case, looking at 2017, 2019, which were very wet. I want to finish by saying the gray band represents almost every single plausible water supply condition that could happen. And even under one of the driest water supply conditions, you can see it looks like it would be a couple of years at least before we might return to average water level conditions. But I wanna preface that by saying, or follow that up by saying, we are not in average conditions right now. One of the contexts for any type of forecast has to do with soil moisture across the region. If you look at this ranking of soil moisture percentiles, 
much of the Great Lakes region and upper Midwest is the wettest it has ever been. So you see those percentiles, 99 percentile, 95 percentile. For the entire region to be blanketed in percentiles like this suggests that it's absolutely saturated. Um, and that's an important precursor to water level simulations that's not captured in this gray band right here. So with that, from that perspective, I think it's very unlikely that um, the water levels are going to be going down anytime soon. So given the time constraints, I'm going to stop there and I'd be happy to, along with Howard, answer any questions and continue the conversation. So thank you again for your attention and for the opportunity to, to share briefly some of our, our perspective from the science on the rising water levels. Thank you very much, Drew. And let me see if I can pull together and ask to you a number of the questions that have come on. I'm going to combine a couple of them. Um, first one from Thomas Weber and another person. Um, as each new year of record water levels occurs, do the precipitation averages get updated? And how do you calculate evaporation? Is it simply the lake level change uh, minus the amount of precipitation? So great question. Two questions there. The first having to do with updating the sort of the average conditions over different time periods. Um, we are we continuously update what we would call the statistics or the quantiles of the historical record. Um, with water levels, that's actually done primarily by the federal agencies, by the Army Corps of Engineers and by Environment and Climate Change Canada. So they are continuously updating what they consider to be the historical record and what the average statistics are over that record. In our science, your question was about precipitation originally. Um, we're constantly looking at different historical reference periods uh, against which to calculate different quantiles. And so yeah, the short answer is yes. We're continuously updating what we consider to be average conditions or exceedance probabilities. The second question regarding estimate of evaporation is a great question. Um, there has been a huge leap in research on this topic uh, over the past several years. But the short answer is that the best way to estimate evaporation, first and foremost, is through models that uh, try to represent the thermodynamics of the lakes, the heat exchange. Essentially, evaporation is the transfer of heat or the pushing of heat into water molecules and causing them to evaporate. And so there are really good models that can do that on the Great Lakes. But the second strategy, is to combine those models with the overall water balance of the lakes, just as your question suggested. And we've been doing that as well. So combining actual process models of the thermodynamics with what we call water balance closure model to make sure that evaporation, precipitation, runoff, groundwater, and other factors add up to what we observe in the water level change. Great question. Uh, Drew, a, a number of questions asked by uh, Pooja, Mark Wagstaff, uh, some other people, and I'm going to combine them. Um, can you talk about what happened in 1930 on your first graph? It seemed there was a steep change from low to high water levels also occurring then. And the 1960s, why were there such low lake levels at that point? And then currently, can you explain why water levels in Michigan and Huron didn't drop this winter uh, as much as is usual? And, and finally, a question from Jack Hutner. Is there a mean water level projection for Lake Ontario? Okay, um, lots, of, lots of great questions in there. Um, Howard, do you mind if I share my screen again? Absolutely. Okay. Go for it. Um, okay, so I'll see if I can remember the various questions in there. So the first question had to do with these very low water levels in the 1920s and the 1960s. So, um, our understanding of the water balance throughout the time period it has a lot of uncertainty associated with it. I'll start off by saying that, part in part because our precipitation estimates, um, if we think about those major components of the water balance, precipitation, evaporation, runoff, um, the, the gauge network density was much lower back then for precipitation and for runoff. So um, our estimates of those water balance components is relatively uncertain. That said, the, the general understanding is that through much of that period in the 1920s, 40s, and 60s, that the water level fluctuations were much more highly correlated with changes in precipitation, um, precipitation falling on the lake and, and runoff, than fluctuations in evaporation 
uh, my understanding is that it's only been recently that we think major changes in evaporation have also been driving variability in water levels. So that was, that was um, one first part of the question there. Um, I think a second part of the question was, why have water levels not um, declined as much as we might think over the past several months? So if we look at this plot right here, um, I think to provide context for that question, here is Lake Michigan Huron water levels over the past um, couple of years. And I think the question relates to this idea. Here's the average water level cycle. If you can, Calvin, can you see my hands as I'm doing this? Yes, we can. Okay. Great. Yep. So here's the average water level really cycle. Really cute, Drew. You're doing that nicely. Thanks. Yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> we've had a lot of practice during the quarantine over the past few weeks. Yep. Um, so what, what the person's question, I think, suggests is why wouldn't water levels during this time period have followed uh, a similar pattern here? And the answer is, I think, twofold. One of the simple answers is that there continues to be abundant precipitation across the region all throughout the fall, and that any precipitation that's fallen has um, propagated directly into runoff. But we've also found that evaporation during this time period has been lower than usual. So um, in other words, what, what would typically drive this decline in the fall, believe it or not, is the increase in evaporation during this time period. Evaporation in the summertime um, is actually quite low. Warm, moist air over the lakes does not lead to evaporation, but cold, dry air that comes in the fall does lead to evaporation. Um, if you have a mild fall when it comes to air temperatures and lakes that are relatively cool, you're not going to have a lot of evaporation. So in general, we have a combination here of abundant precipitation, a little bit lower than average evaporation, um, and then there's one final point just to um, broaden the context a little bit, we're also investigating what we think is a shift in the hydrologic cycle. We actually think that um, throughout the wintertime, more precipitation is falling as, as rain than as snow, and that snow that does fall is melting earlier in the year. And that's leading to sort of a shift to where we get the peak in the hydrologic cycle. Last question had to do with um, water level projections for Lake Ontario. Of all the lakes, um, Lake Ontario is the hardest one to generate a forecast for because it is so tightly regulated. Um, the, at the Moses Saunders Dam, there are, there are gates that can control how much water is let out of Lake Ontario. And the conditions under which water is either kept in the lake or let out depend on real-time decisions about hydrology, forecasts, ice on the, on the river, on the St. Lawrence River. So I'm not an expert in that whole process. But what I do know is that it's really hard to make a projection. That said, there is a, an image just like this one that I didn't download for you, but you can find it on the Army Corps' website for what they think Lake Ontario's water levels will be for the next several months. There are a number of questions that are asked about what we can do about this, what the role is of the Army Corps of Engineers, the IGAC, um, nuclear plants that are on the shoreline. Uh, let me address some of that from a policy standpoint and then Drew might want to weigh in as well. Um, on the questions of what can the Army Corps do, uh, first and foremost, the Army Corps has a role to play in terms of giving us accurate data and projections that everybody can look to, along with what NOAA is doing and people like Professor Grunewald are doing. Um, secondly, the Army Corps controls a lot of the shoreline, uh, the offshore line uh, built environment in terms of revetments and so forth. We need to think about how that gets done. But there are also some agencies here who are very critical. There is a very obscure agency. I'll bet few people here have heard of it. Uh, it's called the um, International Lake Superior Board of Control. It's in effect affiliated with the International Joint Committee Commission. And they in effect control the valve between Lake Superior and Lake Michigan and Lake Huron that controls how much water in times of plenty goes from Lake Superior over to Lake Michigan and Lake Huron. Uh, some people have been contending that when water levels are high along the shoreline of Lake Superior, the Lake Superior Water Control Board tends to open the valve more, which puts more water in Lake Michigan and leads to worse flooding problems in Lake Michigan. Uh, the Environmental Law and Policy Center is going to be beginning a new initiative working with the International Joint Commission uh, and 
providing some presence before the International Lake Superior Board of Control to begin looking at this from a much more systematic Great Lakes issue. Uh, we simply can't look at a connected set of water bodies of what's good for Lake Superior, but not perhaps as good for Lake Michigan or Huron. We need to find ways to manage that effectively together. Um, I mentioned earlier some of the shoreline built environment issues. Uh, some questions were asked regarding the Palisades nuclear plant, the DC Cook nuclear plant uh, in Western Michigan. The same might be asked with regard to the spent nuclear fuel rods being stored for the Zion nuclear plant uh, up in Northeast Illinois. This is part of the uh, built environment along the shoreline that we need to rethink. There's a CID landfill uh, located over on the southeast side of Chicago. All of these were built with the expectation of relatively lower lake water levels uh, than we're seeing today. Uh, we need to rethink the safety, the public health impacts of some of these facilities along the shoreline. Uh, hopefully that addresses uh, a set of questions that came through. Uh, please feel free to do some follow-ups. The Environmental Law and Policy Center is going to be looking pretty significantly at that. Uh, take a look at the map that we just put up uh, for you to take a look at. Uh, Drew, anything you want to add on that one? At this point, nothing in addition to add, Howard, although um, I, you know, our research does suggest that the, the ability to, to control the rest of the lakes through Lake Superior is ultimately relatively limited. Um, right. the, the setup of the controls there relative to, to what can happen down on Lake Ontario, but it's great to see that you're having that dialogue, so that's yeah. good. With regard to Lake Ontario, less impact. With regard to Lake Michigan, which hydrologically is a big bathtub, uh, a little bit more of an impact. And again, there's not a magic bullet here that you can do one thing and it's gonna fix everything, but we need to look at this at a more systematic basis. Um, there are a number of questions here about the Clean Water Act and how it applies. Um, obviously, the Trump administration is looking to roll back the clean water standards that were adopted during the Obama administration. Uh, that rule has been finalized. We expect it to be published soon. Um, when it is, the Environmental Law and Policy Center, Natural Resource Defense Council, and others will be challenging that in federal court. Uh, we believe that's not well grounded as a matter of hydrology. It's not well grounded as a matter of law, and it's just bad policy when it comes to protecting uh, community waterways. Uh, more on that to follow. Um, we're, we're sort of hitting the end of our time here. Uh, let me see if, Drew, you want to make any sort of broad overall comments about a number of questions people are asking about. Um, how do you look at the future? Are we in a world of much higher water levels going forward? What's the effect of evaporation? What's the effect between lake water levels and aquifers? Any sort of closing comments you want to make on those questions? Yeah, sure. There, there's some general comments I can make. The first of which is people ask, what can they do? Attending a webinar like this one, where we can broaden the range of understanding of what it truly is that drives water level variability across the lakes. And hopefully by attending this webinar, you've gotten the impression that these, these large scale forces of precipitation, evaporation, the dynamics between them are ultimately are leading to these water level changes. Just to put it into context, the changes that we're seeing and we're talking about here, the fluctuations, we're talking about a meter of water level rise over a short time period. And those fluctuations are driven by these changes in precipitation and evaporation. So recognizing that is a huge first step towards making better management, management decisions in the future, while also recognizing um, that those two forces, while they're increasing, can change at, at any time. I mentioned as an example that when an Arctic polar vortex deformation happens, or an Arctic uh, vortex as it's called in the popular media, that has a dramatic impact on, on evaporation. And there are other similar anecdotes I could give about why water levels might fluctuate. So keeping that in mind, I think is really important as people make decisions about what type of water level extremes to expect. Water levels are likely to continue to be high, but they could also be low again over the, the, the future. Uh, and that's sort of a take home message for, for interacting with the coastline and planning. All right, thank you very much, Drew, for joining us this morning.
excellent. My pleasure, Howard. And My your, pleasure. Your science work here is extraordinarily valuable. Uh, you've been joined by 148 people uh, attending this webinar. Um, we will be posting it on the Environmental Law and Policy Center's website, www.elpc.org, www.elpc.org. Uh, people have asked for some of the maps and some of the other presentation matters. Uh, they will be posted on the website as well. So people can download as the webinar has been recorded. Please feel free to share it with people. Uh, final. At the Environmental Law and Policy Center, sort of a three-part message of what we will be doing going forward here to make a difference. First of all, you've heard the message from me before about preparedness. If there's anything that we've learned from COVID-19 public health crisis, we need to prepare in advance for what Drew Grunwald and other scientists are telling us is likely much higher water levels coming this spring and summer in most of the Great Lakes and the flooding and the pressures on the shoreline and erosion that we're likely to see. That's a scientific reality. We need to prepare for what's coming. Uh, secondly, we need to rethink the shoreline's built environment and how natural systems can be used in light of the climate change realities of much more extremely higher water levels in many years and occasionally some lower water levels. That's gonna require science, environmental engineering, land use planning, zoning, hydrology. We're gonna to need to put all the tools to work. The Environmental Law and Policy Center will be engaged in that with a number of allies, public officials who bring other tools to the table. Uh, and finally, we need to recognize the realities of climate change. Uh, it's happening as the state of the science assessment of the impacts of climate change on the Great Lakes is shown, uh, WW welpc.org backslash uh, GL, as in Great Lakes, climate change. Uh, this is real. Uh, we are looking at changes in the water levels along the Great Lakes, and we need to both try to mitigate climate change problems, and we need to have solutions from the policy standpoint that help do that. We also need to adapt, and that's the rethinking of the Great Lakes shorelines built environment and how to better use natural systems. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you again to Professor Drew Grunwald. Let's stay in touch. And thank you to ELPC Communications Director Mary McClellan, who did the heavy lifting in terms of putting this well together. Take care, be healthy, be safe, be well.